Joining me today is Tony de Fonseca, who is the MD of OBC Butchery or OBC Group. Tony started his working life at a, at a local owned advertising agency. He rose from humble beginnings to managing director within a few short years and was instrumental in negotiating a merger with global communication giant DDB. This brought with it access to the global brands, and before long, Tony managed to steer DDB SA into a top coveted top 20 bracket of South African agencies. In 2008, Tony was offered the role of managing director by one of the agency's clients, OBC Chicken. The lure of making his mark in the, in the complex emerging market, mass market, while revitalizing a somewhat tired brand at the same time proved irresistible. After assuming his new position in 2008, Tony negotiated the sale of the company to a financially strong shareholder with great synergies. He then set about revamping the company from the bottom up. Free of financial constraints, Tony built OBC Group into the fastest growing player in its sector, with over 50 stores trading, trading profitably. Most of the OBC chicken stores are uh, franchised and store count will increase to 80 plus by year 2020. Tony is passionate about franchising and keen to give back to the industry. He joined FAS's board of directors in 2012, served as its chairman for two terms during 2018 and 19, and currently holds the office of immediate past chair. Tony also serves as a director of the Consumer Goods Council of South Africa and of the SAPCC. Welcome, Tony, and thank you for joining us today. Hi, thanks, Ramani. Appreciate that. Nice to, to chat yourself and to everybody listening out there. Thank you. Good, good. You know, I tell you what, this COVID-19 has just thrown everything out of, out of all sorts and upside down. And I'm so happy to have you on board because you're one of the first businesses who, in, who had to operate or as an essential business in le under level five. So you've had a lot of experience having to adapt, having to retrain staff, having to get used to how to deal with this COVID-19. So I'm very excited to have to be chatting with you today um, about some of the challenges that you are facing and uh, things that you can just share your knowledge with others with regards to how they're going to prepare their business or insights or what you've experienced throughout this throughout this time. Uh, but, but before we get started, can you explain what OBC does uh, as briefly as you can? Sure, sure, I'll do that. Um, OBC actually started as uh, many years ago, 38 years ago as OBC Chicken, and they literally just sold chicken, um, mostly in, in uh, commuter markets. Um, at that time, there was no really shopping malls in township communities, so it was more in taxi ranks, bus ranks, and that type of thing, and literally just selling all things chicken from the you know, the full muscle chicken breast and, and, and thighs and down to wings, but also the heads and the necks and the gizzards and the livers and the feet, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And even the the entrails, which we, 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 we tend to, or the market tends to call exhaust pipes. Um, so that's where OBC started, it was all things chicken. And then obviously as the business grew and the market started changing, we started expanding uh, into selling more groceries and essential groceries or basic foodstuff groceries. And then meat products, being beef or pork or sheep, um, including all the offal products that go with it. And then slowly started growing the stores to now become sort of an essential food, essential food uh, uh, store. And so much so that we've called ourselves OBC Better Butchery recently. So the, the core focus on the business is the most essential food. So everything from you know, your basics in your meat and chicken and range, and that would be from your top cuts down to the cheaper cuts, which would include all the, the offal products, as I, as I referred to. Um, and then also with the core, core range of groceries. So, you know, we'll only focus on, on really the top sellers. So we'd keep uh, a top brand of a baked bean, for example, and then a house brand of a baked bean. And that will follow right through and apply to rice and to key lines where we keep a brand leader and then a house brand with it. And really just focus on essential foods and what people need every day to survive. So that's really our business. So our stores range from 500 squares to just over 1,000 squares, depending on, on the market and the trading density we, we anticipate in the area. So it's really just uh, it's a bit difficult sometimes. It's, it's kind of a, a smaller supermarket that only sells food and food stuff. And we don't really get into personal hygiene or cleaning products or anything like that. So it's really just about essential food. 
Okay, so as an essential service, uh, the COVID, what, how has this COVID-19 impacted your operations? Look, it's, it's uh, you know, we've, we're very fortunate that we've, we could still trade, uh, and albeit with, with, a, lot, with a lot of um, difficulties at times in terms of, um, of getting things done. Um, but again, you know, there's a, lot, we, there's a lot of industries that haven't been able to operate. So, you know, we count ourselves as fortunate that we not only have always seen ourselves as an essential food store for our target market, but obviously it's an essential service. So we're very fortunate in that. So the, the difficulties have really been um, around trying to manage the staff and obviously, you know, um, um, looking at how do you apply social distancing when you've got preparation kitchens and people working in, 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 in kitchens where they're preparing meat and they're preparing packing meat and that. So that's, that's sort of added a bit of a challenge from an operational perspective. Um, and I'm not saying this was a good thing, but in 2018, there, you'll all recall there was a case in Listeria by some of the meat producers as well. Um, and I suppose we're fortunate in a way, not that that condition arose, but as an industry, that there was a lot of more stringent health regulations placed on the industry as a whole by the Department of, of uh, Agriculture and by the Department of uh, um, um, the health authorities as well. So in that regard, uh, you know, in hindsight, not that, as I say, Listeria was a good thing to have, but it placed a lot more emphasis on the industry as such in terms of proper protocols in, in health and hygiene. And we took it very seriously. We, not that we weren't, but we've, we, we applied different uh, and more stringent regulations in our stores in terms of complying with health and safety issues right across the board, not only from food preparation, but just in terms of how we handle our stores. So I think that, in a way, prepared us better to adapt quickly to this. So our biggest challenges have probably been more in the distribution center, where We've tried to split our teams into two, and then they're working different shifts and on different days just to try and keep some kind of uh, social distance as well. So we've got less people working in the, in the distribution center um, and then running them in, in, in sort of half. One, one shift runs half the week and then the other one shift runs the, the other half. And we just work, you know, the guys work a bit longer um, to make sure that all our stores get, um, get supplied. And of course, you know, it's a big concern for us because if, if our distribution center get, gets affected, then it'll, it'll affect most of our other stores. But that in itself has, comes with challenges because then you want to have less people working to comply with social distancing so that you can supply all your stores, but then travel regulations come in. So your staff has to be home by 7 o'clock as of this morning, whereas curfews until 8 o'clock this morning, we got, uh, uh, we got a new advice saying that although curfews until 8 o'clock, taxes have to drop off their... Have to drop off their passengers by seven o'clock. So now it just places a different emphasis. And again, it, it takes one hour off because before our distribution said we work until seven o'clock and then we would ensure that transport to get the staff home before curfew. But now it's changed again. So those are the challenges we've had. It hasn't really been in, in the marketplace. Obviously, you know, uh, there's been a lot of uh, emphasis on us in terms of, of managing the queues, getting into the store, managing uh, how many people can be in your store. And our biggest challenge has probably been, you know, we've adapted quickly to get stock into our stores and we've quickly put up uh, uh, glass screens at our tills and face screens for our staff, mask sanitizers, we brought it into our DC and we got it to our stores quickly to comply with all the regulations, floor stickers, encouraging social distances, messages up on our TV screens, in our in-store radio. So we adapted quickly. The biggest challenge really most times has been dealing with the authorities and trying to keep up to the continuous change of regulations. And in a lot of instances, authorities that visit you to try and impose don't themselves understand the regulations. So, you know, we've had situations where, where police have come in and pushed our managers around demanding that you can only have 15 people in a store. We employ 60 people in that store, so that would be physically impossible. Um, and then we sort of agreed with them that we'd only allow 30 customers in. Uh, and at that time, it was allowed to have 50 customers into a store. But it all depends, you know. So it's those type of regulations that make no sense. So in our stores that, as I said, range between 500 and 1,000 square meters. Technically, we could have 50 meters in our stores, but the same would apply for a hypermarket, which would have three times the, four times the floor space, also only allowed 50 square meters. So now we've suggested that maybe we should allow one customer in per four square meters of, of floor. Those are more practical suggestions through to the authorities. So from a business perspective, we've adapted quickly to make sure that we um, have the products available for our franchisees and, 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 and for our customers. 
So the challenge has really just been trying to understand the constant changing regulations and, and passing that information down to our stores. So, so as I say, it's, it's probably the, the challenge of, of keeping up with regulations and changings and curfews and can taxis drive, can taxis drive, how many people in your store, controlling the crowds outside your store, what do you do if they don't, if they don't want to comply? We know we're not, we're not, um, you know, we, we're not an authority that can force people to, so we can only prompt people to comply and to be patient. So from our operational business, from our business, we've adapted quickly. It's really just trying to, and, and of course we have to be responsible and do the best we can managing the queues outside our stores, but we can only manage, manage it for, you know, the immediate area around our stores. Um, and we can't manage the queues. It's not, you know, that's where the authorities need to come in and manage the queues that go beyond the mall itself. Um, yet they'll arrive and want to shut you down because the people outside the mall aren't keeping social distancing when you've, you're complying with what's required within the immediate area of your store. So, yeah, so it's been challenging, but like I say, it just makes us stronger. You know, we adapt quickly, and as I say, fortunately, as a head office team, you know, we've got a great team um, that's expert in their fields, and although most of the admin guys are working remotely and getting everything that they've done, and new, you know, we, 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 you know, with Consumer Goods Council and with the Franchise Association, we're getting immediate um, notification of any ch changing laws. Uh, our our in-house attorney interprets it quickly, simplifies it, and get distributes it to the stores quickly, so they quickly can react and start complying on a ground level. So it's been challenging, but like I say, I did, none of the, what I've said is a complaint because, uh, you know, we've been very fortunate, very blessed that we could operate. So we're in a good position. As a matter of fact, uh, most of our stores are in township communities so they've traded well where we've found some difficulties is in the stores that are based in the city center and that's largely with a lockdown a lot of people weren't coming to the cities to work and then of course with the taxi regulations only traveling morning and evenings it just wasn't convenient for clients to come in so we found that our our township community stores have actually grown in 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 basket count um, in some instances in feet, feet count but it's mainly our city center stores that have have have, have this month especially felt that you know sales could have dropped by by up to fifty percent, but that fortunately uh, is is the minority in our group, as most of our stores are out in township communities. So so like I say, we we're very fortunate that we can trade. So so uh, yeah, hopefully that was. Uh, uh, I know sorry, it was a long answer to a short question. So hopefully no, that, uh, that was great insight. I mean, that's just giving us a real perspective of of the challenges that business needs to face. I mean, luckily, fortunately, you're a franchise. So you've got people and teams and, and people that you can work with. I mean, for smaller businesses, that could be quite a lot to adapt to. I mean, I'm just thinking while listening to you, I, you've also had to most likely train your staff. And, and what about the testing? And I mean, it's like, here we are, we've got COVID-19 lockdown, and now you're pretty much jumping into the deep end of it all, um, having to, to, to get your staff organized, um, having to train them, having to get them used to, to all these changes. Uh, what has been your, your, your insights on that? Well, again, I guess we were, we were more fortunate than most because in, in our business being predominantly in the meat business, um, a lot of those, um, you know, so now maybe we're using, uh, you know, the difference would be the, um, the uh, um, you know, the, the hand sanitizing you've got to constantly do. But our business being mostly in the food business, a lot of those protocols were in place. You know, people were wearing gloves when they dishing out meat. Um, um, they're wearing headgear. They, they weren't necessarily wearing face masks, of course. Um, so that's, so, so in terms of, of cleanliness in our kitchens and in our prep areas, I think we just really looked at, at the, the, the chemicals we're using and make sure that they sort of upgraded in terms of uh, not only having a deep cleansing effect from cross-contamination between different kinds of meats, but we've always packed different kinds of meats at different stations. Um, there's the protocols in where you've got different color uh, cleaning utensils, or, you know, and that's from brooms, buckets, and everything for certain departments. So any cleaning utensils in the butchery department stays in the butchery department. Any cutting utensils stay in there as opposed to uh, cleaning equipment in your bakery. So a lot of those protocols were there. So a lot of our staff is used to working under the, uh, those products. The biggest challenge we have, as I say, is trying to keep social distance in the store when people are in preparation kitchens. Um, but I must say our staff has adapted well predominantly. I think they're also feeling fortunate that they can at least carry on and, and that fortunately we can carry on paying the salary. So there's been a, a lot of our franchisees. It's been actually quite encouraging to hear some of the stories coming through, where they've provided assistance to staff with elderly parents, um, even in terms of 
a couple of our franchisees um, uh, and uh, even from ourselves, from a head office, looking at sort of uh, um, flu vaccinations for the staff. Not that flu vaccinations will prevent a COVID-19 inspection, but at least hopefully it will prevent the flu, is that if someone coughs, um, you'll be a little bit less worried that it's just the normal flu uh, than something more, more serious. So, 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 yeah, so, so it's been a lot more education. We've, we've also spent, sent a lot of uh, uh, sort of education material on the importance of washing hands, which, again, those protocols were in place. Just, but now re, re-emphasizing that you've got to wash them properly and a different way to wash your hands that, that covers your entire hands. We've made sanitizers available everywhere in our stores, on our deli counters, in our kitchens, on our tills, as customers come in, as is required. We currently, um, we've battled a little bit getting uh, infrared thermometers um, to all our stores. Quite a few of our stores were equipped where we're tracking the staff's temperature as they come in during the day, as they leave, and we're keeping those protocols in place. Um, and we've actually just ordered more thermometers from all sorts of suppliers just to have enough. And by the end of this week, all our stores should have. But it has been challenging where, where you know, you, again, you get a regulation saying that you've got to do this, which I think is fantastic. But try and find an infrared thermometer right now. And when you do find them, you know, we've had the same thermometer varying by, in price, quotations, by up to a thousand rand on, a, on, on exactly the same model from various suppliers. Sure. Uh, and then even a lot of the times we've paid up front and we've had to wait 14 to 21 days to get delivery of them because, again, the market's running out. So those are the type of challenges. And I mean, so managing our staff, but then there was also some crazy regulation that we've got to take the temperature of every single customer that comes into our store, which can be challenged. Yeah, which is like, you know, we've put forward that this is insane. So even, I mean, how do you, if you get 30,000 customers in your store per month, how do you do that? Uh, and what do you do with the information afterwards? And again, we mustn't forget a lot of our customers walk to our store. So obviously when they get to the store, um, their temperature is slightly elevated. Um, yeah, hot and bothered. <laughs> sorry, what's that? Hot and bothered. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, so, so some regulations, just it's, it's almost impossible to decline. And, if, and, if, and I agree that everybody mandatory to wear a face mask. Um, we, we've been fortunate that most of our clients um, have arrived with face masks. Where they haven't, we've, we've offered to give them one. But uh, one instance, a franchisee did say that there was a customer that didn't have a face mask, and he, he, got, he got upset, and he got a little bit violent that they wouldn't let him in, and he just walked in. What do you do? You know, we, again, we, we, we can't arrest them. So, so we'll do our very, very best to comply. And, of course, we encourage our consumers to, to comply, and we'll assist wherever possible. But certainly from a staff perspective, just getting back to the main question, unfortunately, our staff were quite used to working under sanitary conditions, dealing with so much meat and poultry and what have you. Um, so I think they adapted very quickly in that regard. And, I mean, we've got our cleaning protocols in every store of cycles of cleaning. We've just sort of re-emphasized and make it more regular. And, and what we've added is obviously continuous sanitizing of any flat surfaces in our stores, being deli counters, a fridge, you know, with those open island fridges where people lean into quite often to get stock out. So we've got people constantly up and down sanitizing. And um, so, so, yeah, I, I would say, again, we were fortunate that we were in a predominantly food business. A lot of the cleaning protocols were were kind of second nature, and now we just sort of make it, you know, we just entrench them more and more, you know. So, 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 so it has, again, it's, it hasn't come without its challenges, but, but we adapted quickly to it. That's good to hear. We've had some comments come in. Sean Goldberg is saying, wow, that's very complicated. And uh, he's also saying that you're a great example of why being a franchise is a blessing right now. We've had a, a, a comment from Jackie Steinschaden. Sorry if I forgive me if I've interpreted that wrong. Uh, franchise businesses have to think forward, and it's very challenging. Adapting to hygiene compliance is key with contactless options and agility to adapt to functions to the cloud enables remote access and continued reporting for decision making. So that is the comment that's coming from Jackie. Thank you for sharing. Um, Tony, can I ask you, uh, are prospects, sorry, how do you see this impacting uh, on your business model in the short and medium term? Well, obviously, operationally, it's added a bit more expenses, um, especially with all the sanitizers, gloves, um, etc. cetera. Um, so, and obviously, we've quickly responded and added uh, screens on our tools and face masks and that type of thing, which is, uh, I don't see it as an expense, but rather an investment, as I say, given that we very fortunate that we can trade. Um, 
So, so it, it's obviously going to have a little bit more of, a, of an impact on our operational expenses. Um, like I said, we are in, in, in basic food stuff. It has slowed us down a bit in terms of uh, we've got quite a few stores lined up to open up this year. And it slowed us a bit down where there's a couple of stores that were in between building, constructing, and of course, they haven't been able to carry on. So there's been a bit of a delay with opening stores. Um, our guys, our ops guys, haven't been uh, haven't been really been able to go out and provide support as much as they would like, as we constantly do. Um, and but they, you know, they're providing a lot of remote support where possible. And this month, with the easing of the lockdown, we are getting our ops guys just to do inspections in the stores, but also again uh, approach it very carefully because the last thing is we want, you know, is is an ops guy. And and that's the challenge now is that our ops team is rearing to get out there, and they have been going out. Uh, cautiously, as I say, but the difficulty is if you send an ops guy into a particular area now, you some in some areas you simply just cannot find accommodation because even though uh, accommodation for essential workers is is allowed, some establishments have just decided it's not worth keeping open to to so so in some areas we simply cannot find accommodation. So the guys are going out providing support and returning back home in the same day, um, and once in a while we manage to find a place to stay. So, so, so it's, it's, it's impacted on us in just in obviously, uh, you know, sort of quickly adapting to new protocols of working. Um, we've had to respond very quickly to certain situations. And, and, and you know, uh, even though there's been lockdowns, there's been a lot of late online meetings uh, on how we adapt and how we, what we need to do the next day to make sure that we're in compliance. It has slowed down us, has slowed down our um, um, ability to open up stores in the short term, even though we, we're seeing how we can try and speed that up. And it's a pity, though, because in many instances, a lot of these businesses, as I say, most of our businesses are, 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 are out in the rural communities and, and in the rural townships. And it's a pity in a way, although understandable, because these businesses would, would provide employment. I mean, our stores can employ anything from 30 up to 70 people per store. So, But again, it's understandable, as I say. So so in the short term, it's... it's um, it's it's added a bit of the cost, but again, it's not a complaint because at least we can operate. So, and I, I, for a few of our guys, they've actually done they're doing quite well now, uh, mostly because, as I say, people have really haven't had the money to, or they haven't had the opportunity to spend their money on liquor or cigarettes or even takeouts um, until recently. So, being in, in 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 the butcher type business, we found that people have to buy more food to cook at home. So, so as I say, most of our stores have actually gone up nicely, even though their overheads have. Have come up um, again. Even from a lot of landlords, we've 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 seen a tendency to want to listen and want to adapt. We also, as a business, have taken the policy that we have to be fair. So, where stores have, have maintained their turnover, even if they dropped uh, a little bit, we have to do the right thing, of course. And uh, I, I mean, you know, I've heard of instances in some areas where stores have done well, but still want this rent reduction. And of course, everybody wants a rent reduction. I mean, uh, rent is one of your grudge purchases every month. But we have to be fair. I mean, we have to, where, where, where stores have battled and we've approached a couple of landlords for some assistance, they've been amenable. And that's, that's been a great, there's sort of a, a collaboration in that regard. So, and not, in, not in, in most instances, because I do understand that landlords and, and property owners also have their own overheads and increased costs. But there's been a willingness to engage and to discuss and find a model that suits both parties. It's in nobody's interest to take a heavy handed approach and close a business down. It's just right now, we have to work together, both landlords, franchisors, franchisees. We've got to be pragmatic. We've got to be realistic. And we've got to be there to help each other out in, in, in these tough times and, 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 and pay what we're supposed to pay. And when we can't, then, you know, you, you, you know I've always been one that will fight, exceptional fight for my franchisees. But I, I have to fight with conviction. So if somebody tells me to go negotiate that rent when their turnover went up, then I, I simply won't do it because I can't fight that fight with real conviction. But where if somebody uh, is, is, is dropped, then absolutely with full conviction, we'll approach the landlords and have a, a very good discussion about how we can assist and keep this member going. So that's essential to be realistic about the situation that you're in. Wow. Okay. That's, that's quite interesting. Uh, Sean is also saying that in the UK, they are installing cameras that can measure 300 people per minute. Uh, per minute's temperature and spot if they are wearing face masks. That's quite interesting. Yes. Um, I've, sure. yeah, I've read of the technology. We've uh, obviously, I'm not quite sure what the pricing of that technology is, but it's fantastic. The nice thing about our business is that actually we're not, we're not huge uh, stores. I mean, um, and we normally like to have a controlled entrance point and then a controlled exit point. So we've been looking at some of these other um, 
uh, I don't know what you call them, these like spray, I don't want to call it a spray booth because that sounds, you know, you've got to be, treat your customers with respect. Uh, um, but have a, a booth that people walk in. And it's actually been interesting to see that there's actually infrared, uh, those, those, a lot of those units are motion controlled and have a, a, a built-in thermometer so you can check on your customers as they approach and as they walk through the booth, it measures their temperatures, which for us works well because, like I say, our stores aren't massive hypermarket-type environments where we've got controlled entrances. So we're looking at, imp at implementing that as we go forward as well just to help facilitate, you know, it's, it's much easier than having somebody at the entrance measuring everybody's, uh, and when you're busy, you know, people will try and get past without measuring. So, so we're looking at those type of, of solutions for ourselves. Yeah. So there is a lot of, it's been an interesting, a lot of innovation. Uh, I wasn't aware of the one detecting without masks. Uh, that's interesting. I mean, temperature, that's why I say there's been a lot of technology that's coming to the fore that will hopefully make our lives a little bit easier. Again, at a cost, I'm sure. But um, what can yeah. we do? You know, as a game, we've got to look at it as an investment in keeping to do business, I guess. Yeah, one does, hey. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of pros prospects I can imagine uh, attracted to your business model. Uh, do you see the interest being maintained given the current uh, trading conditions? You know, I actually do, you know, because at the end of the day, um, you know, I often say to our franchisees that, you know, we, we, we're an essential food business and, and people need to eat. Uh, and, and I often say to them, you know, if you can't sell your customer a T-bone steak, then sell them a chicken head or a, or a chicken neck, or, but they have to eat something. And, and our store provides it. And often we see um, customers in our stores that come in and buy a decent basket of good cuts of meat. And then, you know, you get the individual that comes in and literally buys a packet of fat and skins and a little bag of maize meal and a little bit of gravy, and that's the meal for the day. So so we do serve a diverse market that... Uh, that um, so uh, actually, I think it's I think the opportunity to to grow in our business is actually, you know, and I hate to say it, but you know, I've always said to the guys, it's in tough times that we should be that we should be growing. You know, we haven't built our business on on being the cheapest, because um, although we serve a, a lower income market, I mean, so much so that they're much, they're more discerning buyers. You know, and I often remind our franchisees that, you know, if if a lot of us buy something that isn't great and take it home to eat, and it's not great, we'll chuck it away and and we'll just cook something else. In many instances in our business, if we sell our customers a, a substandard product and they can't eat it when they get home, then that family will go hungry that night. And that, that that's on us. It's on us and our franchisees. You know, that's quite a big responsibility in terms of making sure that we're selling decent products to our to our consumer. Even if it is a a, a cheap protein or a cheap business that it's 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 the best that you can buy for at, at that product. So we haven't built our business on price. We've we've really Focused on on being focusing on excellent service, um, on consistency of our products, and on on, on quality. You know, um, so so we don't profess to be the cheapest, uh, and we've seen customers reacting to that. Where obviously you can't be ridiculously more expensive, but if your quality compensates for you to get a few more cents out of a kilo, then our consumers, although uh, in many instances on. Uh, um, a, a lower income uh, um, a market, um, they'll actually pay that a little bit more because they know they can trust your quality. And that's what we've seen in, in, in even in this market. I mean, our house brands have done exceptionally well. Um, and we've actually found in, the market, in our market, our house brands have actually been growing. And mostly because it's great quality, sometimes packed in, in line with the sort of brand leaders. But being a house brand, we can we can get it at a better price. We can distribute it at a better price. Our, our retailer makes uh, an increased margin on it, and yet we still put it on our shelves at a lower price for the consumer. So we've seen a vast growth in, 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 in groceries, so much so that in the last month, I mean, groceries, as I say, our business is really about chicken and meat, and our business was about, up to now, sort of been averaging 80, 82%, uh, sorry, uh, between 80 and 78% in, in perishables, and groceries are between 20%, 22%. We found a marked increase over the last month that groceries has increased um, to 30% of the basket. Um, and yet, and that hasn't really dropped our perishable sales. So, so it's just showing that customers are, are sort of buying products that will last longer on their shelves that they can keep in their cupboard. Um, and, and we've seen an increase, I mean, it even caught us by surprise that even in a house brand maize meal, um, which uh, Maize Meal is one of those brands that communities are very loyal to their particular brand. But we've seen our house brand Maize Meal, which is great quality at a good price, grow radically. It actually caught my distribution center by surprise where they ran dry for a day or two and then they quickly replenished it. So, so, so that's why I say I think even in terms of our business model, 
you know, I think for a tough economy, our business is is uh, is, uh, is suited to serve uh, a tough economy because we're giving value for money to our consumers. We've been very fortunate as well that we've partnered with CIFA and and and, and they've funded quite a few of our our, our, our up and coming franchisees. And and uh, now you know with CIFA, they've uh, we've we've and, and obviously been part of of, of FASA and even part of the Consumer Goods Council, has certainly uh, assisted us in that process where we've been engaged with CIFA for. Quite a long process, but we were accredited, and they've sort of pre-cleared some funds for us for for to to create opportunities for individuals that previously wouldn't have the chance, and it's come with a grant with a grant portion as well to assist, uh, um, as I say, individuals who previously wouldn't wouldn't necessarily be able to get into the business, and we've just opened two recently uh, with CIFA funding and with a with a portion of grant funding, which has been it's, it's been it's been great, and, and I possibly couldn't have come at a better time because. Um, there's a lot of opportunities, a lot of sites becoming available for key businesses like ours that attract feet. So I, I would like to believe that we must remain positive. Yeah, it's going to add a little bit of cost in setting up stores and in, in, in keeping all the protocols going. And um, But I think, yeah, again, we're very fortunate we're in, in essential foods. We I often say that we in the in the business of, of daily essentials and, and we, as a country, we often forget a lot of our consumers earn their living daily and they're trading on the streets, they're hawking, they're selling stuff, they're buying stuff in our stores and in other stores, they're trading in taxi ranks. Um, and if they have a good trading day, then they'll buy a bigger basket that day. And if they have a bad trading day, they'll buy a small basket. So it's really about having something that your market needs daily because we're daily essential. And um, and that's impacted a lot of our customers not being able to, um, you know, earn their living daily. And, and it's been quite sad now. And that's why we end up seeing long food queues and that because, we forget as a country, we often forget as a country that there's a lot of people that earn their living daily. They they they, they don't necessarily on in the formal market and getting weekly or monthly salaries. Um, so I, I think yeah, I, I do think it's going to create great opportunities. We're going to have to obviously buy harder, fight hard to keep our costs down, keep our, our setup costs down. We just hope and pray that Eskom can keep providing us electricity and that they don't um, that they they reasonable about it, about the increases and don't make it unaffordable to trade because that's been one of the biggest factors in our business has been the cost of electricity and made it very difficult at times to to cope with that and we've just had to again fight harder uh, get more value to our customers to really I often say we just need to run away from those expenses and just increase our baskets so we can keep up with the increased costs all the time but fortunately the market has responded so I'm um, you know we, we we had 25 to 30 stores to open this year we managed to open up five and there's quite a few coming up and now it's slowed down a little bit so I'm hoping we can still do 15 to 20 this year, um, and I'm just reading that uh, the, the, our our suppliers can get onto the ground and start uh, kitting our stores out, the ones that we've got planned for this year. Definitely need to get the economy wherever we can, and I'm hoping that we can contribute in our small way by still doing the absolute best we can to open the stores that we had planned to at least get, you know, not only for our own benefit as a brand, but certainly for the economy to, to try and employ as many people as we can and do our little bit. Yeah. Good, excellent. Thank you. Wow, it's been such a great conversation. We've run out of time. And uh, Tony, thank you so much for sharing your, your story with us and insights. Uh, Sean says, thanks, you've got a big heart and an inspiration to franchises everywhere. So thank, thank you. you. If you would like to get hold of Tony or OVC to find out what opportunities they have, I will be posting the um, information in the comment box below after this interview. Uh, but sh do you want to share any last thoughts, anything uh, you want people to get hold of you, Tony? Before I close, yeah. no, sure. I mean, uh, we've uh, you know we've got our website, which is abcgroup.co.za, and there's a lot of information on the group there. And as a parting shot, or as a parting comment, I yeah, these are tough times. Um, I just encourage people to have a heart. To uh, we started our own fund as well in terms of providing hampers through our stores to markets uh, to um, to some of our consumers. Our suppliers have been fantastic in terms of contributing that fund that we can provide some hampers. Um, our franchisees have been awesome in, in, in going the extra mile, not only to provide a bit of food in there to their, a lot of their customers that are, 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 are that sort of hawkers and that, where they haven't been able to earn a living in supporting them, in supporting staff's parents, in supporting staff's kids that are at school with learning materials. And I just encourage everybody to have a heart to to do their absolute best. And, and as I say, it's not about the amount, but about the intention. And um, I just... 
as I say, these are tough times, and I just encourage everybody to to stay focused, do the absolute best you can, and uh, and this is a time like no other that we should bless others with whatever we can. So and that's really just the parting shot. But as South Africans, I think we'll get stronger by this eventually, hopefully. So don't lose hope. Stay stay positive. We are. Uh, we are a strong bunch. We are. And I know. Indeed. Thought. You know, I love that thought. We need to be kinder to one another during this time. See how we can help each other and support each other rather than it just being about me, me, me. Let's let's find a way of working together. I love that. Thank you so much, Tony. Thank, uh, Thank you for the opportunity. Just as a reminder, sorry, just as a reminder, FASA is a non-profit organization that protects, lobbies and promotes and develops ethical franchising uh, across all sectors within South Africa with specific focus on transformation. FASA offers membership to both existing franchisors and franchisees who supports and runs ethical businesses. If you want to know more about FASA, you can visit them at www farsa.co.za. Thank you everyone for joining us and have a super day and week going forward. Thank you, Tony. Thank you.